So good evening and welcome to the session for orientation on uh, MRCVG part two. So um, let us start talking uh, in detail about, uh, I'm Dr. Gunakrishna, I'm MRCVG mentor of SmartMed, the chief mentor of SmartMed, as well as I'm an international update of Uh So today we'll be talking about uh, the orientation on for MRCVG part two. So the agenda of the meeting is, um, content of the exam, the methodology, and two topics that we are going to discuss, right? All right, so um, I know many of you are busy with the pre-Eid uh, shopping, the pre-Eid uh, uh, celebrations. So uh, many of you personally texted me that, uh, Madam, we are not able to join because we are, um, it's, it's uh, a Friday today, especially it's the pre-Eid Eve. Uh, so we are uh, in, uh, uh, we'll be able to, listen to the recordings in the YouTube, okay? Uh, and some of the girls in the UK have also texted, requested to um, make um, a recording of the session, which we are doing now, right? So let's just talk about the content of the exam, right? So the content is, uh, you'll be examined in all the following modules, the 15 modules, teaching appraisal and assessment, clinical skills, medical medicine, post-surgical skills, post-operative care, surgical procedures, antenatal care, information technology, clinical governance and research, then oncology, urogynecology and pelvic problems, postpartum problems, so the prenatal problems, then ecological problems, the general gynecological problems, the fertility, sexual and reproductive health, early pregnancy care, management of labor and delivery. So the exam pattern for the part two MRCOT consists of a computer-based testing examination. So there are two CVT papers, the computer-based test papers, each paper counts for the same amount of marks that is part Paper one comes for 50% of the mark and paper two also comes for 50% of the mark. Each paper consists of two question formers, single best answers, which is worth 40% of the total mark and excellent matching uh, questions. The ENQs worth 60% of the total marks. So the timetable is as such. Um, you have paper one and a paper two. Paper one is of three hours duration of 180 minutes. And the number of questions will be 50 SBAs and 50 EMQs. So the uh, RCOG generally uh, recommends the candidates to spend 70 minutes on the SBA questions and one 10 minutes on the EMQ questions. They'll run approximate lunch break for 60 minutes. And then you'll have the second paper with a similar pattern. So the materials that you're supposed to read, the reading material is from the RCOG Green Top Guidelines. So whatever the RCVG website materials, you're supposed to be thorough with them. The green job guidance, the consent advice, the clinical governance uh, topics, uh, the, uh, this is the scientific impact papers, uh, the strategy materials, nice guidelines, at least the latest three year talks. Uh, talks on the thing that the uh, obstetrician and gynecologist, that's the journal of the, this is recommended by the RCVG. The SSR guidelines, the BASH guidelines, the HRA guidelines, the BSG, the BUSG guidelines, and the NHS. CSP program and embrace. So the practice books, yes, you have to work on the SBAs, the EMQ books, the repeat questions, the recall questions, strategy uh, SBAs and EMQs and talk SBAs. Mocks, we have two free mocks for the course candidates at the end of the course, uh, which is similar to the exam pattern. Right, so we'll be starting with our September batch uh, crash course for eight weeks, uh, starting from next week. That is um, next Friday, 15th of July. And uh, the, the January course uh, is being already started, but still we have some vacancies. So anyone willing to start for the January 23 preparations can join us and still we promise to give 48 sessions for them. We will be taking some common safety sessions for those who are joining late with us. Uh, so we are uh, having the registration uh, going to close soon so we can make the best utility of these. So we'll be providing you the live sessions. The session recordings of the live sessions will be available with the students as long as um, you are with us and until you pass the exam. The, you have the Google Drive access to all the materials and recordings to leave us. So that's only sufficient if you just going to revise the slides by heart the slides, because all the materials are summarized as for the needs of the exam. And everything you need uh, for the exam is being offered to you as a single plate in a single course. Also, there'll be module-wise mock exams and correction and feedback given to the candidates based on the performance and areas to work on. It is just sufficient to devise the, uh, I mean, all these are just sufficient um, 
uh, for you to uh, clear this exam in one go. And you'll be having sufficient revision sessions also before the mocks. And then we'll be having two free mocks and individual feedback. Uh, basically, we'll be having mini mocks at the end of each module. There's a separate homework group for the course candidates, which is being actively monitor, monitored by the moderator of the course. And topic-wise, module-wise homeworks will be given and the answers will be discussed. Along with that, we'll be giving you the uh, smart hour sessions, that is one hour intensive session, at least weekly five days, by different monitors. Sometimes it'll be me, sometimes it'll be the other monitors, and they'll be able to uh, you know, interact with you for that one particular hour. It's a live intensive session for you guys. Right, so having said about that, thank you and best wishes. And we'll uh, directly go on to the topics. So the topics of uh, discussion today will be bladder pain syndrome. So bladder pain syndrome is nothing but pain, pressure, and discomfort, which is related to urinary bladder with lower urinary tract symptoms of more than six weeks duration and the absence of any infection or any other identifiable causes. The management of chronic pain should be used for the initial assessment of this condition. Prevalence is around three to six percentage, between 30 percentage and 60 percent of the patient presenting with chronic pelvic pain, CPP, have bladder pain syndrome. The diagnostic criteria for interstitial cystitis, previous that is called uh, interstitial cystitis, now it is called bladder pain syndrome. So it is associated with pain uh, in uh, the bladder or uh, when she's, when bladder is full and there's also increased frequency. Then you can see glomerulations, that is pinpoint petechial hemorrhages and cystoscopy or the classic Hannah's ulcers seen after hydrodistension and anesthesia to 80 to 100 centimeters of water pressure for one to two minutes where the glomerulations must be diffused and present in at least three qu quadrants of the bladder at a rate of at least 10 per quadrant and not along the path of the cystoscope, as this may be an artifact. Hannah's lesions may be identified as inflamed rival areas or non-blanching areas in the chronic state. Painful bladder syndrome is a supra-pubic pain related to the bladder filling in the absence of any identifiable cause. In uh, interstitial cystitis uh, patients, they have typical cystoscopic and histological features. A three-day bladder diary with input and output is useful. Patients with bladder pain syndrome, uh, they will classically avoid small volumes. So this is useful to um, identify the severe of the storage symptoms. The first morning void is a useful guide to the functional capacity of the bladder. Estimation of the risk field given volumes after maturation should be accessed using bladder scans as part of the initial investigations if there are concerns about incomplete bladder MTE. Record the food diary intake also. That is not seen. Okay. Dr. Manikam, thank you for informing me. All right, so is my slide visible now? Is my slide visible? Is my slide visible? Now it is well seen, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Dr. Manikam. So, all right, thank you for letting um, me know. So, let's, so uh, that's why it's the working display properly. Right, so let us restart with the bladder pain syndrome. So this is nothing but pain, pressure, and discomfort related to the eroded bladder with lower eroded tract symptoms or more than six weeks duration, in the absence of infection or other identifiable causes. Management of chronic pain should be used for the initial assessment of this condition. Prevalence is three to six percentage. Between 30 percentage and 60 percent of the patients present with chronic pelvic pain have bladder pain syndrome. Diagnostic criteria for interstitial uh, cystitis, pain associated with bladder or urinary frequency, glomerulations that is pinpoint particular hemorrhages on cystoscopy or the classic harness lesions seen after the hydro distension and the anesthesia uh, to 80 to 100 centimeters of water pressure for one to two minutes where the glomerulations must be diffused and present in at least three quarters of the bladder at a rate of at least 10, uh, 10 per quadrant and not along the path of the cystoscope as this can be an artifact as well. So harness lesions may be seen as inflamed tribal areas or non-blanching areas in the chronic state. Painful bladder syndrome is nothing but supra pain related to the bladder filling in the absence of any identifiable cause. Interstitial cystitis patients, they do have the typical cystoscopic and histological features. A three-day fluid diary with input and output is useful. Patients with BPS, bladder pain syndrome, classically avoid small uh, volumes 
Um, so this is useful to identify the severity of the toric symptoms. The first warning word is useful guide to the function capacity of the bladder. Estimation of vestibule fluid volumes. Um, after the mixed maturation, this should be assessed in bladder scans, that is the, um, the transabdominal scans. As a part of the initial investigation, if there are concerns about incomplete bladder entry, record the food intake diary also because spicy food, colas, um, you know, um, a fizzy drink can irritate the bladder, right? So there could be so many reasons that we'll be talking about. Hysteroscopies, other causes of sterile pyuria should be considered. You don't need to practice stones, partially treated UTI is carcinoma in situ of the bladder. And those with a suspicion of urological malignancy, urine cytology should be tested. Characteristic glomerulation, reduced bladder capacity, and bleeding could also be found. Cystoscopy may be used to aid in classifying the BPS, the bladder pain syndrome. Cystoscopy findings co correlate poorly with the symptoms. The investigations that are used to diagnose the BPS include urodynamic tests may be considered if there are coexisting BPS and overactive bladder. Um, uh, it could be because of um, OEB or SUI or um, voiding dysfunction that are not responsive to treatment. Leaving urodynamic pain or bladder filling um, causes a reduced first sensation to void and reduced bladder capacity uh, with, along with the consistency of the BPS. However, there are no urodynamic criteria that are diagnostic of BPS. The presence of BPS of more activity is seen in approximately 14% of the patients with BPS should not preclude a diagnosis of BPS. Other tests include pressure flow studies may be considered in patients where there are no coexisting warning symptoms but are not recommended for the diagnosis of BPS. Bladder biopsies and hydrodistension are not recommended for the diagnosis of BPS. Cystoscopy does not confirm or exclude the diagnosis of BPS, but is required to diagnose or exclude other conditions that might mimic BPS. BPS is a diagnosis of exclusion. So you have to remember this fact that bladder pain syndrome is a diagnosis of exclusion. There are a few uh, diagnoses in our syllabus. Uh, obstetric cholestasis, peripartum cardiomyopathy, to name a few, are again diagnosis of um, exclusion. And um, therefore, if something is a diagnosis of exclusion, please rule out all other conditions before you uh, arrive at the diagnosis of a bladder pain syndrome. So further treatment of the MDT after the failure of the previous lift, hysteroscopy, felgration, and laser treatment, and transurethral resection of the lesions can be considered if unless lesions are identified as hysteroscopy. Neuromodulation, there is nothing but nerve stimulation in the form of posterior tissue or sexual neuromodulation, oral cyclosporins, Cystoscopy with or without hydrodistension, major surgery may be considered as a last time treatment in refractive blood acne syndrome. Neuromodulation, that is a uh, posterior tibial nerve stimulation, usually for 10 to 12 weeks. Sacral nerve modulation involves an initial test phase with insertion of a test like tunnels under the skin, uh, transmitted onto the nerve roots, existing uh, the S3 foramen, causing stimulation of the pelvic and the period nerves. Both are in the procedures also. EMS is an office patient procedure with no incision. Total hysterectomy and urinary diversion in the form of bladder augmentation and neobladder formation, less intermittent discussion is the right to surgery can occur. Urinary diversion in uh, for, a, for an ileal conduit. Without sort of this hysterectomy, will not require intermittent self catheterization. The patient has to catheter herself using a catheter. Okay, so this is called intermittent catheterization. Whenever she gets the, you know, the feeling of pain, she has to um, do intermittent self catheterization. So treatments that are not recommended are oral hydroxyzine. This is not effective. Oral pentazone polysulfate again is not effective. Long term antibiotics with avascal. Uh, resinifractor toxin, intravesical bacillus can be due to the BCG, high pressure, long duration hydrodistension, and leukocorticoids are treatments that are not generally recommended. Right, so coming to the bladder pain syndrome and pregnancy, the effect of pregnancy on the severity of the bladder pain syndrome can be variable. Um, bladder pain treatment options considered safe in pregnancy, oral amitriptyline and intravascular heparin, all the one cause of depso. Uh, may be used prior to pregnancy, optimal remission with good pregnancy outcomes, but some DEMSO is found to be therapogenic in animal studies. Right, so there's a question for you guys. 
a 29, 28 years old woman pregnant with a history of pelvic pain, urinary urgency, increased frequency in nocturia. The pelvic pain tends to occur during the bladder failure and is relieved by voiding. And we suspect that the patient has got interstitial cystitis. So interstitial cystitis is a cystoscopic diagnosis. Uh, it's an older terminology we nowadays call the bladder pain syndrome. What are the mandated investigations that is required to accurately make a diagnosis? Is someone step in the answer? Dr. Manikam says D. You don't need a diary. Anyone else? Anyone else with an answer? It's a shortcut. You need to do a diagnostic test. Mandate investigation that you need to do, uh, which will clutch your diagnosis. This is a cystoscopy. So you don't need a diary, just you sit in the OP, the urogenic OP, and you just give it the chart, the frequency volume chart, or what we call it, the bladder diary, OK? So the mandate investigation to pick up uh, the accurate diagnosis of bladder pain syndrome is cystoscopy. Dr. Manikin, play with this. So according to the talk, it is said okay, that, yeah, thank you. So according to the talk article, it is estimated that about 1% women with the special cystitis would eventually be diagnosed as having transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder. If for some advocate that cystoscopy is mandatory, a bladder daddy would show the low volumes and increased frequency, but this is not diagnostic. This is not diagnostic. Likewise, urodynamics show a hypersensitive bladder with a low capacity. Question as the pelvic pain and frequency of the scales can be for diagnosis, but does not rule out any sinister pathology. So that is why we have to do a cystoscopy. Right. All right, so let us check about the next topic. So let us talk on another interesting topic for the day. Let us talk about some infections. Uh, let us talk about gentle herpes today. All right. So let us talk about herpes. So this is a picture to just um, you know open up to know what is then what we, we are talking about. This is group of vesicles. Um, so when this is found in the genital area, we call it genital herpes. So HSV1 and HSV2, oral lesions and genital lesions do occur, meningual encephalitis, neonatal encephalitis do occur, which is transmitted via the fluid secretion and sexual contact. Clinical features, prodrome, last for 12 to 24 hours. There'll be regional pain, tingling and burning, headache, fever, and granular lymphadenopathy, anorexia and malaise. Papules, vesicles, and erythematous based and erosions appear over hours to days. Vesicles, which is uniform in size and the tens, uh, center umbilicates to form a depressed center. These patients usually rest and then heal without scarring. Clinical features, um, we continue. Again, ulcers can occur at the introitus, erythromyitis, labia, and the perineum ties of the buttocks. Record recurrent HSV outbreaks usually are milder than the initial episode. There are typically a few group lesions, and viral shedding occurs at a lower concentration and for a shorter duration, that is about three days. Recurrences are spontaneous. Factors such as fever, uh, nerve or tissue damage, physical or emotional stress, exposure to heat, cold, or immunosuppression, concurrent infection, and even intercourse. Diagnosis is for the swab test, swab from the HSV lesion taken for culture or the PCR. 
a viral culture differentiates HSV1 from HSV2. PCR testing for HSV DNA has got a greater sensitivity, and you can also do a serological testing. Management of hospitalization only if there are signs of meningitis, including severe headaches, stick, uh, stiff neck, or fitophobia, symptoms of uh, autonomic nervous system, including urinary retention, constipation, diastasis of the perineal, sacral, or the lower back region, symptoms of transverse myelitis like the leg weakness or depressed deep tendon reflexes. If meningitis is suspected, CSF, PCR, begin the therapy with IV acyclovir, 5 to 10 milligram per kg every eight hours. Please do not wait till you get the PCR results uh, if the patient has got gentle lesions, suspicious of HSV, and has uh, above indications for above uh, an aggressive therapy. Given the symptoms to prove, switch to oral therapy for a total of around 10 to 14 days of treatment. My dear friends, you have to realize one very, very important fact. We are learning the core curriculum of the RCVG syllabus in the part two. Part one is just um, uh, you know, uh, the basic sciences, which is pertaining to obstetrics and gynecology, according to the RCVG standards. Part three is whatever you study in your part two, 20% of this will be taken. And uh, it would be um, one of the domains of technical knowledge. And uh, we have the rest of the other domains, the information gathering, communication with patient and colleagues, communication with, um, um, the communication with patient, communication with colleagues, and in patient safety, okay? So, but MRCVG part two is quite challenging. Uh, if someone has cleared the part two, that means they can easily get along with part three without much difficulty, all right? So whatever you have studied so far as a part one candidate would be a totally a different uh, thing that you uh, study for part two, because this is the core subject, the core curriculum, and you really need to work extra hours, um, concentrate on module-wise, and that's why we uh, we really uh, are trying to give everything in the form of our courses, our mock exams, which is going to help you out uh, day in and day out because you're all busy professionals uh, with your families, with your kids, with your commitment towards your patients, commitment towards your family, your kids, uh, elderly care sometimes, uh, and your practice, your hospital, your duties, and all that is part of, part of any doctor's career. But again, having an effort to sit for the MRCVG part two itself is, uh, needs a lot of courage, determination, and to help you in this journey of MRCVG, we are here to support you. So our uh, candidates have done um, extremely well in the July exam, the July 5th, and we are yet to uh, waiting for the results. We are sure that we are come out well with flying colors. So um, it's right time, guys, who were up, up here for the part one. It's right time that you please start preparing for your part two, do not wait for the results because um, if you uh, can start to prepare uh, right now, it will be easy for you when you sit for January and then the following January, the following May, you'll be able to clear, 23 May, you'll be able to clear your master's degree and get your master's degree in hand. Right, so uh, try to uh, remember this fact, this, this amount of hard work, and determination and efforts are needed and that is why we are here to help and guide you and my dear September colleagues, you have already been in a good shape and that's why we offer you the eight weeks course, the crash course, just the revision course for you guys and you can have the mock exam at the end. Whereas for the January guys, um, who are preparing for January or who have appeared for your part two, part one and awaiting the results, please do not waste any more time and start preparing for your guidelines. So please participate in our intensive courses uh, you know, in terms of revision hours, uh, yeah, the smart hours we call it in terms of live hours. All right, so please participate in them, uh, and we'll be uh, giving you the maximum um, the input uh, at this point of time so that it will be easy for you when you actually start preparing after your part uh, one results. So having spoken that, let us talk about the treatment of gentle herpes. The first episode, uh, you can give an acyclovir or trambicyclovir or velastoclovir as soon as possible. Uh, prompt treatment for the initial episode will reduce uh, uh, reducing the constitutional symptoms by three days, local pain by two days, viral shedding by seven days, and uh, mm, um, until all the lesions are crested by three days and time, until all the lesions are healed by six days. So this is an exam of not only understanding, but also memory. So whenever there's a number, I always tell my candidates, please remember, learn the numbers by heart with a proper understanding, with a 
context of the subject because this is not only uh, an examination of uh, knowledge uh, of the core subjects, but also uh, uh, where you have to memorize so many numbers and percentages. Right. So in three cases, IV acyclovir, four to five milligram per kg body weight every um, uh, eight hours for up to two to seven days or anti-clinical improvement followed by oral therapy to complete a minimum of 10 days total treatment. Recurrent hepatitis patients should self-initiate uh, treatment as soon as possible. So they'll be given their self kit uh, and they'll be provided with a prescription in advance. Uh, the goal of episodic therapy is to reduce the symptoms and infectivity during the episode. This episode, this therapy does not prevent future recurrences or asymptomatic shedding between the episodes. Total ACEC level is not effective. Continuous suppressive therapy decreases but does not eliminate transmission. The treatment of genital lepers in um, HIV patients is, is, is same as that uh, with uh, for normal patients. So this, I mean, for people who are not with HIV, um, immunosuppressed patients may develop extensive genital lesions that may respond to routine courses of antiviral therapy. So be sure to treat aggressively in early. Treat early lesions that are not extensive with usual doses of oral medication if no improvement occurs or if initial involvement um, is extensive. Try oral medication. If no response, give high dose IV acyclovir. Prolonged treatment may be required. Neonatal lepers. Neonatal lepers is classified into localized disease with the skin, eye, and mouth with a good prognosis. CNS disease with cotton phylitis. Disseminated infection involves the multiple organ involvement. Risks. So, this is again a very, very important aspect. So, all these times we've been talking about gentle lepers. Gentle lepers in relation to pregnancy. Very, very important. We'll be getting humpty number of questions. Gentle herpes is one of the favorite topics of activity. So remember, wherever the primary gentle herpes are present at the time of the delivery and the baby is delivered vaginally, the risk of the baby getting neonatal herpes is estimated to be 41% each. Women presenting with recurrent gentle herpes at the onset of labor should be advised that the risk to the a baby of the neonatal herpes is low, that is 0 0.3, 0 to 3% for vaginal delivery. So women presenting for the first episode of gentle herpes in the third trimester, particularly within the six months of the expected date of delivery. Uh, and type specific HSG, HSG is IgG antibodies to HSV 1 and 2 uh, testing is advisable. The presence of antibodies of the same type as the HSV isolated from the genital swab would confirm this episode could be a recurrent rather than a primary infection and elective ARCS would not be indicated. It may take two to three weeks for the results of this test to become available. It is therefore recommended that an initial plan of delivery should be based on the assumption that all first episode lesions are primary genital herpes. This plan can be modified if the HSV antibody test results are subsequently confirmed a recurrent rather than a primary infection. Breastfeeding is recommended unless the mother has got hepatic lesions around the nipples. The prevention of postnatal transmission, yes, in 25% of the cases, a possible source of postnatal infection is um, responsible, usually a close relative of the mother. The mother and all those with herpetic lesions who may be in contact with the neonate, including the staff, should practical uh, should practice careful hand hygiene. Those with the oral herpetic lesions with the cold source would not help the neonate. HIV and HSP in pregnancy, women who are HIV positive and who got a history of genital herpes should be offered daily suppressive acyclovir of 400 mg three times daily from 32 weeks to reduce the risk of transmission of HIV infection, especially in women where our general delivery is planned. Um, starting therapy at this early gestation, then you should, should be considered in view of the increased possibility of preterm labor in HIV positive manner. EPROM uh, in primary herpes, if there is initial conservative management, the mother should be recommended to receive IV acyclovir 5 mg per kg every eight hours. Prophylactic corticosteroid should be considered if the delivery is indicated within six hours, sorry, within six weeks of the primary infection, delivery by cesarean section may still offer some benefit despite the prolonged rupture of the membrane. Recurrent type was P prom before 34 weeks. Expected management is appropriate, including oral acyclovir 400 mg three times daily for the mother. P prom after 34 weeks antenatal corticosteroid administration. Primary hepatitis in um, <clears throat> In, 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 the, uh, in the third trimester in the labor, cesarean section should be recommended for all the women present in primary episode gentle herpes lesions at the time of delivery or within six weeks of the expected date of delivery. IV acyclovir give, given intrapartum to the mother, 5 milligram per kg, every eight hours and subsequently to the neonate 
with IV acyclovir 20 mg per kg every eight hours may be considered for those mothers opting for vaginal delivery. It is unknown whether intrapartum acyclovir reduces the risk of the endotelitis infection. Application of the FSC, that is the fetal scalp elastro, fetal blood sampling, um, artificial obstetrics or instruments of diabetes should be avoided. Low risk values of labor, the increased risk associated with invasive procedures is unlikely to be clinically significant, so they may be used um, if required. Shrom, that is a quantitative rupture of membrane at term, then you have to experience the delivery. Right, so let us come to the question. Uh, a case of recurrent herpes. Uh, so before I come to the question, let me uh, take you through the algorithm. Let me go to the primary source, that is the ACUG algorithm. So this is again on the dash guideline. <clears throat> and this is uh, whatever, whatever we study now, it's nothing but the summary of the bash guideline. As I told you, we are uh, summarizing everything and giving you in the form of slides so that it will be easy for you uh, to uh, learn these slides by heart without uh, you know, uh, uh, spending time to look on the guidelines to learn from where and how, okay? So we are uh, actually, minimizing your uh, efforts and we are offering everything as a platter. So let me come back to uh, my algorithm. So algorithm for the bandage of the uh, herpes in pregnancy and care of the unit. If it's going to be a recurrent genital herpes, so we talked about what is primary herpes, we talked about what is, uh, what is recurrent herpes, so a recurrent genital herpes, let me take my pointer, please. Let me take my pointer. Right, so guys, just remember these facts. Uh, recurrent genital herpes, uh, if she is coming with uh, recurrent episodes of genital herpes, treat the episodes with standard doses acyclovir if necessary, and consider acyclovir 400 milligram three times daily for from 36 weeks onwards and offer her with general delivery uh, and a normal postnatal care. And if there are genital HSV lesions at the time of delivery, again, you can still offer her a normal postnatal care and discharge home uh, at uh, if the baby is well at 24 hours and advise parents regarding a later management if any concerns for the baby. However, if there's a primary acquisition of the genital herpes in the first and the second trimester, this again is almost similar to recurrent genital herpes, okay? The first and the second trimester, we are safe. The mother is safe. So the treat, treat the primary episode with standard doses of acyclovir, nothing but 400 milligram three times daily for a period of five days, right? So this is where you'll have to remember one fact that for chicken pox, we take 800 milligram five times daily for a period of seven days, whereas for um, um, this particular uh, infection, the genital herpes, we give acyclovir from three times daily for a period of five days. Remember, friends, that acyclovir is a medication which is not licensed to be used, but it is safe to be used for pregnancy for treating chickenpox or genital herpes during pregnancy in the UK. Okay, so even if it is not like not a licensed drug, it is still um, one of the drug of choice as well as it is safe to be used in pregnancy. So treat her with the same thing uh, for a period of around. Um, um, five days, and then consider giving her uh, 400 milligram sites daily from 36 weeks onwards. And this is where we told in HIV that we are giving the suppressive dose at 32 weeks because there's a there's a risk that uh, she might go in for a preterm labor, either itrogenic or if she goes if she um, uh, goes for a shrong. So we are taking uh, in view of the HIV status of this pregnant woman. 
So we are giving the procedure starting from 32 weeks onwards. But for everybody else, we are starting from 36 weeks onwards. So again, we can just offer her original delivery, a normal post-entry care. And if at all, if there's any genital necessity, and the delivery, so do not body, a normal post-entry care, and still miss the action for hours to be well and unhealthy. Okay. The third trimester, please treat the primary episode uh, with standard doses of acyclovid that we just spoke about. Consider giving her acyclovid 400 milligram three times daily until delivery and recommend a planned CS, especially within if within six weeks of delivery. Okay, especially if within six weeks of delivery. If the vaginal delivery uh, ensues, please involve the neonatologist because there in the UK it is always women's choice. The women uh, will be recommended to go for a cesarean section, but if he refuses, the choice is hers. So it's a patient uh, centered, it's a patient shared decision. If this particular woman refuses, plan to see for whatever the reason, or if the um, if the vaginal delivery ensues before plan to see please inform the neonatologist and please check for the wellness of the baby. And start a cycle with 20 milligram per kg at times daily for 10 days for the baby while you are awaiting the results of the test. On the other hand, if uh, you do um, a planned CS, uh, again, you'll be informing the neonatologist, a normal postnatal care, which has the baby. Uh, if 24 hours, uh, the baby is after 24 hours, the baby is well, advise the parents regarding any concern for the baby. Um, See, you have uh, a patient, a uh, third trimester, a woman who's being affected by primary herpes and uh, vaginal herpes and uh, vaginal delivery has happened. The baby is found to be unwell. Do not worry. Please inform the neonatology team. They'll be performing the lumbar puncture for HSV, CSVR. All right. So, and then the baby will be managed accordingly to the, um, the, of the report by the neonatology team. Right, so let me come back to my slides. We'll have a couple of questions before we close the session. Right, so let me come back to my session. <clears throat> a very simple question for you guys. Okay. Right, a case of recurrent herpes. Let me go to the slideshow. Right. So, um, a case of recurrent herpes. She's 40 weeks in labor. She's fully dilated. The midwife noticed a small lesion on the right labia. So, what action you will do for her? Allow vaginal delivery, category 1 CS, category 2 CS, oral acyclovir or IV acyclovir and vaginal delivery. Come on, guys. E, not sure. You're not sure? Yeah. So who is this answering? Aparna? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, Aparna, okay. I can see that you've just joined the uh, series. So don't worry. We just revised the guidelines stating that if someone is coming to uh, with a recurrent herpes, even in the third trimester, the risk of transmission is going to be 0 to 3 percentage. And uh, so we can allow her to go for a vaginal delivery, right? But if the same woman is going to come, that's what we were saying, the algorithm, we were uh, discussing with the algorithm that if she's going to come with the primary herpes, the third trimester, then we will offer her cesarean section, uh, elective CS, CS after informing the neonatology team. And then we can offer a, a, a postnatal care, a normal postnatal care. And this has to be at 24, um, uh, after 24 hours, if there is no symptoms, and again, advise the patient regarding any baby concerns. However, if at all, if a, a vaginal delivery ensues, please uh, find out if they inform the neonatology team and see that the baby is fine, the baby is well, so please um, uh, do the testing when then you cannot afford to do the testing, you can do a skin swab, a gentle swab, mm, you know, swabs from the conjectural swab, everything you can do. And you can start the baby on 20 milligram per kg TDS for a period of 10 days of 
acyclic etc okay on the other hand uh if the baby is going to be unwell again the neonatal legitimacy will be involved and they'll be doing a uh, lumbar puncture of hsp c uh, pscr which is by hsp pscr okay and then they'll be treated according to the protocol on the other hand if there's a recurrent herpes uh so why we are giving so much of importance is because of the increased risk of transmission okay so that is around 41% so this is again a repeated time tested question for you guys so the percentage of the risk of transmission for a primary herpes uh, uh, to a postnatal uh, to uh, uh, to the fetus in utero is going to be 41 percentage but as that of a recurrent herpes is going to be 0 to 3 percent so that is why with all these uh, knowledge at the background so we we'll have to understand that it's going to be a recurrent herpes and 40 weeks in labor and fully dilated uh, with a midwife noticing a small lesion on the right labia so we'll just allow her to go for a vaginal therapy so wish you all the best guys so again i will show you what we have been doing for the part two guys so long so that you'll be having a first hand of experience so i'll just show a simple example of uh, as i told you we have only six members uh, six batch uh, six members in a course we don't have uh, much uh, you know we don't take so many uh, students because we don't believe in running after batches so let me uh, focus my my uh, slides so that it will be easy for you guys to just know what what we've been doing so far for the part two guys right okay uh yeah so basically uh this is our course batch so we'll be uh the there'll be only six candidates and they will be coached uh for a period of 12 weeks or 16 weeks or 18 weeks so whatever is that uh choice they, of course we have the common group that you are all aware we will be posting all uh, our day to day sessions and yes we have something called as a homework group um there we will be uh, you know we will be giving homeworks regular homeworks and to be monitored by the monitor uh, monitored by the moderator and not only that um, it will be going to be a module wise approach so our sessions are module wise sessions and each session uh, will be recorded and it will be offered in the google drive and uh, at the end of each session you will be given a set of questions um, uh, mostly from the recalls and the books so uh, by the end of 12 weeks or 8 weeks you will be thorough with all the recall questions all the study materials all the guidelines will be provided to you in the form of slides so all the slides will be with you and you can just memorize them and learn by heart and no need to read any other material because we are combining everything and giving you in a platter for you to use to absorb as well as there'll be a uh, once the session is over so we go this way uh, like we will for the 12 weeks course for example if i take so we'll have the 12 weeks course so 14 modules will be discussing in 12 weeks time and we will be starting with a module and the necessary materials all uh, for the course candidates will be shared at the google drive with the moderator and then we will be posting the schedule on which particular day we have the sessions so uh, those sessions will be recorded and uh, at the end um, of the lecture you will be discussed all the relevant recalls of that particular uh, module uh, all the relevant recalls will be discussed in the live sessions itself and then uh, the homeworks will be posted uh, in the homework group and before they come for the next session they will be thorough with the live sessions the recall questions the book questions which is formed in the form of homework as well as every day they are supposed to participate in the uh, smart hours the live intensive hours where you will be exposed to different questions uh, from so many other books uh, and so many other materials will be from so many other sources uh the all your uh, you'll be exposed for the you know, the smart hours the live intensive hours and you'll be having a mini mock at the end of each and every module so uh, i'll let me again show you by telegram uh, where you'll be seeing our candidates having posted the um, the mini mock questions and answers uh, so I, after every uh, session uh, as i told you after every module we will be focusing on the homework as well as see this is our uh, the candidates we are uh, posted our so this was the homework which is given to them uh, in one of the modules and um my candidates they would have attempted the mock exam the mini mock exam for each module and they would have posted the answer so before suppose if we take early pregnancy module 
in a week's time, we will, my candidates will be thorough with whatever been taught to us in the form of the live sessions, in the form of the discussions, the lectures, and the recall questions worked out after that. They'll be thorough with the book uh, exercises, the book questions, uh, and they'll be uh, uh, tested. Uh, what about their knowledge in the mini box before they sit for the next session? So if you can, uh, if you can show, I can show you, uh, this was just the latest ones. So we will have a different set of, so if you can see, this is going to be a mock exam. So, um, uh, so this is our answers that we've been posted and uh, you can see the mock. See, for example, this is our one of the candidates, uh, you know, her mock uh, exam on SRH in teaching um, mock uh, exam has been conducted and she's posted the answers. So she'll be evaluated and same way. So each and every mock. So this is for the Gaini mock, uh, the Gaini module. And this is for the Gaini oncology module. So all that uh, will be posted for our candidates. So we will see to that uh, you are by the end of 12 weeks or 16 weeks, you guys are thorough with uh, the syllabus and at the end of uh, the course towards the exam, you'll be offered two free mocks of all the uh, syllabus that they are supposed to have studied, all right? So this is a program and this is why uh, we are having, uh, we are running the sessions to just make uh, the guys available uh, aware of what is happening. So this is for our September batch, um, uh, the eight weeks uh, uh, course, and uh, this is for the January batch. So guys who have already appeared for the part one and waiting for the results, guys, we are already in the process of preparing for the January 23. So please do not waste time. Uh, it is like for the 24 weeks and 48 sessions and two free mocks and uh, all these have been already posted for you in the Telegram group. So you, you have to be aware of all these things. And um, we see to that you do study, right? So we're not someone who will conduct the session. We will uh, forget the students and then meet them for the next students. No, I'm not a mock mentor like this. I'm not my team as well. So we are dedicated mentors who will see to that you'll be able to pass in one go and we see to that you study, okay? So that's why we have the group moderator who's going to be at the back of you to check whether you've done the homework, whether you have done the mocks, whether you are prompt in attending the sessions and whether you're prompt in answering. So all that will be uh, monitored by the moderator. So we've already started for January 23 batch. Uh, we have already started um, our uh, 24 weeks uh, session program. That is the, um, the long course. And um, as uh, we will be also uh, announcing uh, the five uh, months course and the four months course also, but I would sincerely suggest anyone who wants to join for the uh, for the Jan 23 course can join as well now so that they will be able to, uh, we can also offer them uh, some extra sessions because we have uh, covered a couple of modules, but we will be compensated for that, okay? All right, so any uh, queries for me for this day? Any queries, guys? So uh, if there are no queries, then we will wind up the session. So thank you so much for joining. And all these will be recorded and posted in our uh, YouTube channel. So please subscribe to the YouTube channel to get all the accessibility. And I wish you all the best. Have a pleasant evening and good night. Thank you all.